Welcome to video lecture D5. This one is on determinants and volumes. I'll be your organizer, Tom Roby, and here are the outline and objectives. Uh, we'd like to reconceptualize the determinant of A as computing a kind of signed volume of uh, generalized parallelograms or parallel, what we call parallelopipeds in R to the end, defined by the column vectors of A. So I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And then we'd like to understand the determinant is the, the absolute value of the determinant as being the factor by which a linear transformation given by a matrix A rescales the volume of any S subset of R to the N. So if you've got a measurable set in R to the N and you look at how the linear transformation takes it, if the determinant of that linear transformation is minus 2, then it's basically blowing things up by a factor of 2 in terms of area. Okay, so again, I'll show you examples in a minute, but let's just start with a, a simple example. Suppose I want to find the area of the parallel parallelogram, just in R2, determined by two vectors, which I'll call A, C, and B, D. You can think of them as the columns of the matrix A, B, C, D. So let me draw a picture here, and let's see what we can do. So if my first vector here is, um, I guess you can't see that, but you can see that part of it, then that means that this must be the A, and then the height of that vector is b, right? So there's a b here, there's a b here, if I or no, a c here, right? So this is a c. Okay, and now um, if I've got bd, that corresponds to this other vector here. So b is the how far out I went in the x direction, and this is the horizontal direction, so this is d. So D is that height there. All right, and so the way I should really be thinking about this is that I've got some big thing. So the, when I do this vector addition, then I'm going out A and then I'm going out again B, right? So there's a, so this little length here is B. And so that means that this rectangle here is a BC rectangle, right? And similarly, the rectangle up here by symmetry is a BC rectangle, okay? On the other hand, I've also got these other regions to keep, keep track of. So for example, this triangle here is one half, um, base is A, height is C, so this is one half um, AC, right? And then another one up here is also one half AC. And then these two little side triangles, well, their height is the height of this vector, so that's D. So I've got D up here, and there it's also, and then this is length B, so this is a half BD triangle, and I've got another one over there. So in order to make this work, what do I need to do? Well, the whole rectangle has A plus B horizontally, and vertically, it's got C plus D, right? Now, from that, I need to subtract these two rectangular areas, which are B, both BC. So I have to subtract 2BC. I also have to subtract, well, 2 times a half AC is just AC. And I also have to subtract BD, OK? So all I did was visualize this parallelogram as being the rectangle a plus B times C plus D, the larger rectangle, and then I subtracted off these two smaller rectangles and these four little triangles which come in pairs. All right, so now you just do this and you say, all right, well, that's not so bad, right? Because this is AC plus BC plus AD plus BD, and now I'm going to subtract minus 2BC minus AC minus BD, and what'll happen? Well, let's see, I've got an AC here that cancels with another AC. I've got a BD. Notice I'm using different kind of strokes to cancel similar things so I can check my work easily later, one of the most important things I learned in graduate school. And now I've got a BC here and a minus 2BC, right? So these guys will combine to give me a negative BC, and what I'm left with is AD minus BC, okay? So at the end of all of this, this is equal to AD minus BC. And of course, that's the determinant of this matrix, 
A, B, C, D thought of as being these two column vectors. Now there's one thing that's worth being a little bit careful about here, namely the area of this parallelogram doesn't depend on um, what order I listed these columns, right? Any permutation of these columns should have the same area, okay? But if I looked at um, the area of BDAC, so compare CF, if I had BD and AC, that determinant is BC minus AD, and of course that's negative the determinant, which is minus the determinant of A, B, C, D. Um, equals the negative of the determinant of that. Okay, so what's going on? Well, so that means that what I'm really computing here is just the area up to sine. I'm not actually getting the, um, I could get plus or minus the area. So if I really want to get the area, I always have to take the absolute value of the determinant and see whether that works or not. Okay, so that's the theorem then that we want to see, which is that if I have any n by n matrix, then the volume of the parallelopiped determined by the columns of A is equal to the absolute value of the determinant of A. And the idea behind this, I'm not going to do a whole proof here. You know, you can always look at, look at a book to, to get that. But the key idea here is that row and column operations affect area the same way um, that they affect the absolute value of the determinant of A, right? So what are those? Well, let's think about multiplying if we multiply a column by k, right, then, you know, suppose I replaced ac with kakc, like 2a2c, right? So I made this vector twice as long. Well, it would make the area twice as big, right? Okay? So, but that's also what it would do to the determinant, because we know that multiplying a column by, by a constant or a row by a constant, it doesn't matter for determinants, um, just rescales the determinant by that amount. So that's good. So those guys work the same way. What happens if I interchange two rows or columns? Well, we just saw that that just changes the sign of things, so it doesn't affect the absolute value. And it also shouldn't affect the area because we're not changing um, which columns we're, are defining the parallelopiped, we're just changing which order we consider them in. And so finally, the last piece of this puzzle is to understand what about adding one, a multiple of one vector to another, right? So that doesn't change the determinant, it also shouldn't change the area. So there's a picture I can draw you for this, namely, you know, I've got um, one vector here. So I'll call this vector v. And I've got some other vector, and, and so what do its multiples look like? Well, its multiples look like, you know, the line defined by it, right? And now I've got some other vector. W here, and what I'm interested in is, okay, so if I looked at the vector the parallelopiped determined by these guys, then that would be this one, right? But now I'm saying, okay, instead of looking at V and W, I'm going to look at V, I'm going to look at W, and I'm going to look at V and W plus some multiple of V, okay? So what does it look like when I add some multiple of v? Well, instead of w then, w plus some multiple of v would mean I'm like adding something parallel to v, right? So maybe I'm out here. So this is w plus some multiple of v, right? And so now what does that look like? Well, now I've got this. Let's see. So now I've got this. This parallelogram. And what do you notice about these two parallelograms? Well, they have the same base. I can think of them as being on the same base and the same height. So that means that the area of this original one should be the same as the area of this new one this longer, skinnier one, okay? So really all we've done is a process called a shear. We've taken this and we've kind of sheared it over, keeping these lines parallel, and when you do that, you don't change the area. Okay, so that's, that's why adding a multiple of one 
vector to another doesn't change the area, and that's the same property that the determinant has, and so that's why this all works. And if you wanted to do a more careful formal proof, you would say, well, by row and column operations, which don't rescale, i.e. switches and adding a multiple of one to the other, um, I can take the matrix A and convert it to a matrix that only has values on the diagonal. Right? But if I have a matrix that only has values on the diagonal, right, so D1, D2, dot, 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 Dn, and if all of these guys are zero, then, well, it's clear that the determinant of this is just the product of those values, but it's also clear that um, this should have, this, uh, what I've done here is I've just said, okay, I've got D1 times um, the E1 vector, so I'm going out D1 in this direction, and I'm going out D2 in this direction, and I'm going out D3 in this direction, and when you look at um, what that is, it's just a, rect it's a rectangle or a rectangular parallelopipin. So for example, if I just had D1, D2, then I would have this picture, D1, D2, right? So those are the two vectors, and they just determine a, a, a rectangle of area D1, D2, okay? So that's the, the, first, the first idea in why determinants and areas are really the same. Okay, so let's um, take a look at the, the next idea here, which is that suppose I've got a linear transformation T, and it corresponds to its standard matrix A by T of X equals AX. Now, if I take any region that has finite volume in R to the N, right, then the volume of T of S should be the determinant of A times the volume of S. All right, so what does this mean? Let's just draw a sort of blobby picture, right? Suppose we're dealing with R2, and I've got, so I've got my axes here, and I've got some blob S in R2. And now I want to see what happens when I apply this linear transformation to it. Well, suppose my linear transformation T, suppose that the determinant, so this is T of X equals AX. Right, suppose that the determinant of A is a half. Well, then what that would mean is that I'm actually taking this region and I'm kind of shrinking it. Or T of S, I should write here. I'm shrinking it so that T of S has half the area that it had before. Okay? On the other hand, if I, the determinant of A was 2, then it would be making the area twice as big. Okay? And the idea is that that is the, it always works. If the determinant of A was negative a half, half, then the absolute value of the determinant of A would still be a half. Okay? So that's the, the vague idea of what's going on. And let's just see a, see a few examples where this is. So suppose that we take the simplest. It's often good to think about what's the simplest possible matrix you can do. So suppose that the matrix is, um, oops, um, suppose the matrix a is just A, 0, 0, D. Okay? Well, what does that do? Well, so that's the matrix. So as a linear transformation, what have I done? I've taken the unit square here. Okay, so this is 1, this is 1. And it maps the unit square to, well, it maps um, 1, 0 gets mapped to A, 0, right? So now I'm out here at A. And it maps um, 0, 1 to 0, D. So I'm out here at D, whatever that was. And so now I've got the unit square has become this unit rectangle, AD. Okay? So that's uh, similar to the picture I was trying to draw um, on the last slide. Okay, so that's a simple example. And uh, we know what the image of the unit square under ACBD is, right? So if instead we have A, B, C, D, right? Then this is taking the unit square goes to, well, like the picture we saw before, you've got this is A, 
C, and then this is B, D, right? And so we're just taking And so we're just taking this unit square now is going to to that one. So here, when you don't have, when you just have a diagonal matrix, you're just doing a rectilinear transformation. You're just stretching in, in, in uh, the coordinate directions. Here I've got something that looks a little bit more complicated, but it's still true that the, um, right, this, this has area one. So the area of this should be the determinant of the matrix. This says area 1, so the area of this should be the determinant of the matrix. And so that's the case we've already seen. But you can do it um, even more interestingly. Suppose we take, um, suppose we look at the image of the unit square. Um, no, instead let's, let's look at this one. So we'll, we'll go back to this A, A00D, zero, zero and we'll say what happens I've learned from long practice that I always have to draw the unit circle first and then, or the unit disk, and then draw the axes if I want it to look anywhere decent. Okay, so I say, all right, suppose I look, this shows you a little bit more what's going on with this theorem. Suppose I take this linear transformation and apply it to this. What will I get as my output? Well, it's still taking 0, 1, 1, 0 to 0, A. So that means I'll be out A here and negative A here. And now it's taking, um, so this would be 0D, so that means that I'm going just up to D here. And I'll go down to negative D here for that one. And so what I end up with is a picture is that the image of this is actually So the image of the unit circle is actually this ellipse. All right. Um, so what does that mean? Well, I know what the area of the unit circle is. If this is the unit circle, it has area pi. All right, so this has area pi. And now what's the area of this? Well, it should be the determinant of this matrix times the area of pi. And so it's pi times a times d. And that's a formula that maybe you've seen somewhere in a pre-calculus or college algebra class that the formula for the area of an ellipse is pi times the um, twice the length of the major axis times the length of the minor axis. But here it just comes out of this general theory. So this gives you a nice example where it isn't just something you could see from trivial geometrical principles that things always get stretched. It doesn't matter how round or continuous the shape is over here. It always works. Now how do you prove something like that? Well, to really do a careful proof of this fact, you need to be able to use some sort of, because it involves things that are not just rectilinear, you use the fact that you can always approximate areas by rectangles. Right? That's what you did in calculus when you want the area under the curve, you approximate it by rectangles. Here you need to approximate a circle by you know, rectangles that get closer and closer to that value, and then the theorem is true for rectangles, and you can use a continuity or limiting arguments to show that it has to be true. Um, in general. In, linear transformations are very nicely behaved functions. They're about as nice as they get. So um, that's what we like to do. So that, that this is, so even if, um, even if all the details of why this is true aren't quite there for you, it's a very useful fact and it's easy to understand. Um, and it also gives you a way to reconceptualize a, a couple of the other things. So for example, um, I've got a little room left here to, to write in. Remember that the determinant of A, B was the determinant of A times the determinant of B, right? So let's think about what this means in terms of linear transformations. Well, um, A, B applied to a vector means that I've got um, R to the N, and now I multiply by B, takes me back to R to the N because it's a square matrix. Now I multiply by A takes me back to r to the n. Now multiplying by b has the property that it takes, you know, some little thing in here, 
my little triangle here, say of unit area, maybe B, you know, makes the area twice as big. And then maybe A makes the area um, one-third as big as it was. So if this changes the area by a factor of two, and this changes the area by a factor of a third, then it's pretty clear, right, that I should expect that when I do both of these things that I'm uh, multiplying by a factor of two-thirds. Oops. So two, let's find a pen that writes, two times one-third equals two-thirds would be the scaling. And so that should be, since this linear transformation is the composition of these, it should be true that the determinant of AB should be the product of these determinants. So that's one, one more way in which this theorem should help um, make a bunch of things hang together for you. So that's it for video lecture D5. Thank you for your kind attention.